This is the second week in a series that uh, I believe the Lord spoke to me and really gave a mandate. I was really planning on teaching something else, and God just kind of intervened and intersected my study and just began to speak in a way that is just absolutely plain. I mean, in a way that I just couldn't miss it and said, listen, son, I want to develop in this church and in this community a culture of hospitality, okay? How many of you enjoy hospitality? Amen. Good. Well, you're going you're gonna to get a lot out of this this morning. This has been a fun study for me because as I've been going about it, the Lord's been teaching me some things, and uh, I'm beginning to see hospitality in a brand new light. All right, and I'm sure you will before the morning's over as well. But God has, has declared that we are to develop a culture of hospitality, okay? And so last week, being Valentine's, we did uh, a message, the first in the series, and it was entitled, I Choose You, okay? Part of developing a culture of hospitality is having a mindset that says, I choose you, in John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said this, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Isn't it great to be chosen? Everybody wants to be chosen. You know what I'm saying? And so Jesus modeled a lifestyle that consistently said, I choose you. You. When a man and woman stand before God at an altar to exchange their vows, what they say to one another is, I choose you. Okay? They're not saying, You choose me, or I'll try, or I hope so, but they're saying, I am making a dedicated commitment for the rest of my life to choose life with this other person, right? Okay, And so what we saw all, as well is that many times in our relationships, what initially is I choose you turns into the question of do you choose me, right? You know, people, you, if you're in a relationship, eventually somebody's going to see a wrinkle somewhere, right? When someone begins to see our, our shortcomings and, and whatnot, I mean, all of us on some level or another, we begin to ask the question, are they still going to love me? You see, and relationships go south when the I choose you of my life turns into do, do you choose me? Okay, are you all following me? If you're new here this morning, this is just a little bit of a, of a recap. And so we all need to hit the reset button in our lives and do relationships following the example of Christ who said, I choose you, okay? We also looked in Luke chapter 10, verse 48, where Jesus is talking to Martha and Mary. And we, we saw that in order to develop a culture of hospitality, that we also need to choose relationship over activity. All right? If you read the story about Martha and Mary, you see that Martha was distracted by many things. And Jesus said that the good thing Mary has what? Chosen. And, it was, and it's not going to be taken away from her. So you and I, we need to choose one another in relationship, and we need to choose relationship over activity. Okay? How many of you think that makes a difference? It makes a huge difference. And so we want to develop a culture here at River of Love, and I want to encourage you to adopt a culture in your life as well that is a culture of hospitality. All right? So today what I want to do is I want to look at hospitality in general, in a little bit more general terms. What does the Bible say about hospitality? In Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9, I just want to add some context here. The Bible says a number of things about hospitality that I think are really, really interesting. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. In other words, be the real deal. Okay? Don't just say that you love, be love, all right? That's what Jesus was. He was love manifest in the flesh. He just didn't talk about love. When you saw Jesus, you saw the manifestation of the Father's love. Isn't that cool? In Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Amen? And his character 
is love. So it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Don't just talk the talk. Let's walk the walk. All right? Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And I'm going to skip down to verse 13. Contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing what? Hospitality. Can I tell you, hospitality is something that we practice. It's something that we have to make a determined effort to engage in. Can I say that? We need to practice hospitality. Literally, it says there, when it says practice hospitality, in the Greek, it literally says pursue hospitality. Pursue hospitality. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Be hospitable to one another without complaint. All right? And I love this. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. See, one good reason to practice hospitality is you may entertain an angel without knowing it. Maybe you have already. Who knows? But I guarantee if you're not practicing hospitality, you may miss the opportunity. All right? And finally, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, talking about the qualifications of elders or overseers in the church, it says, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, okay? Hospitality is very important when it comes to the kingdom of God, all right? So hospitality has to do with what? How we treat others, right? Turn to your neighbor and tell them, hospitality is how I treat others. Hospitality is how I treat you. Maybe. <laughs> Some of you maybe, maybe not, I don't know. So listen, when we're talking about hospitality, I looked it up in the dictionary, okay? I'm just that kind of guy. And uh, the dictionary says that hospitality, because without a definition, I really don't know what most things are. I just like to look things up, all right? So hospitality is the art. It's the practice or the quality of how we treat other people. That's what hospitality is, all right? It's not just having people over for dinner. We call that hospitality, but it's so much more. Hospitality has to do with how we treat other people, all right? So it's where we get the word host, right? How would it be if you invited someone over to your home and didn't practice hospitality? What would that be like? Now, if it was, you know, your best friend or somebody that you hang out with all the time, you might think that's okay. But what if you had somebody that you didn't know, a stranger come over to your house for the very first time, they knocked on the door, nobody answered. Finally, they look at the sign on the door says, please enter. <laughs> so you let your, you know, just come on in and at your, take your own risk, you know. They come in, and you're sitting down watching a football game. All right, they walk in. They ask where the, they say hello. You say, hey, good. Hey, thanks for coming to my house. All right. Uh, kitchen's in there. Fridge is right there. Bathroom down the hall. Make yourself at home. By the way, do you mind moving a little bit? Because I can't see. <laughs> How many of you think that's a good picture of hospitality? Would anybody do that? Maybe Pastor Andrea, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not really. But listen, nobody would do that. When, when we practice hospitality, what do we do? It's, it's how we treat other people, okay? It's really important how we do that. Turn, if you will, and I'll actually land here for a little while. So if you have your Bibles, look in Genesis chapter 18, all right? I want to I take a look at some of the qualities of hospitality. I want to look at the life of Abraham. All right. There's a lot of things that we can learn in this particular story about hospitality. Genesis chapter 18. Abram has been on a journey. How many of you have been on a journey in your life? All right. You've got the promise of God, 
but you're not really walking in the full manifestation of it yet. But you're following God. Do you know that, that Abram received the promise that his descendants would be as the, the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky? And God told him to leave the land in which he lived and he would show him this, this land that he would possess for him and all of his ancestors throughout all of history. And so Abraham believes the promise of God. He leaves his hometown. He wanders in the desert. God says, your, and, this, and your seed is the one through whom this promise is going to come. So listen, about 15 years go by. 15 years. And there is no, well, he didn't know his name was going to be Isaac, but there is no son of promise yet. So Abram says, well, listen, I know how to help God out with this situation. Here's my handmaiden, Hagar, all right? This is how God's going to do it. How many of you have tried to help God out with the promise? How's that work for you? <laughs> all right. Usually you end up with Ishmael on some level, you know. And so listen, uh, you know, uh, Abram receives the promise, and then it's still another, and I might be off a little bit in my time, but, but it's still another 10 years. It's still another, how many of you feel like it's a long time if you have to wait five years, five minutes, to see the manifestation of God's promise in your life? How would you like to go 25 years and not have your faith waver? Never waver at the promise of God. That was Abram, all right? Never wavered the promise of God. Looked at his circumstances for what they were, but never wavered concerning God's word. That's what God wants to build in your life and mine, all right? So it's just about time. It's been 24 years, and all of a sudden, God has a message for Abram. So he shows up at Abram's tent, and this is where we start in Genesis chapter 18, okay? Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, Now the Lord appeared to him, Abram, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he looked up, his eyes looked, and behold, three men were standing opposite him, and when he saw them, he ran. Oh, wait, let's finish the sentence. He ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. And he said, My Lord, if now I found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a, a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I'll bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, make bread and cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and choice calf, and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he, and he was standing by them under the tree as they, as they ate. How many of you think this is a picture of hospitality? Three dudes show up at Abram's tent. And the first thing that Abraham does is he runs to meet them. Okay? Can I tell you that hospitality always offers a gracious welcome? Okay? If we're creating a culture of hospitality, then when we meet others, we're gracious to give them a welcome. You see, Abram rushed out to meet these guys, all right? Another thing about um, hospitality that we see from Abraham is Abraham's sensitivity to their needs. You see, Abram rushed out to meet them, recognized that they'd been without food or water for a period of time, and he, he says, listen, if you will honor me, let me serve you, okay? So, Hospitality gives a gracious welcome. It's sensitive to the needs of others. It recognizes what their needs really are. And you know what? Hospitality always gives the very best. What did Abraham do? He not only went out and gave them water, but what did he do? He killed a choice calf. All right? Now, if a stranger showed up at your house, how would you respond? Would you go get the filet mignon out? 
and create a meal for everyone and lay it out before them and say, I just want to bless you. You see, that's what hospitality does, though. Hospitality sees tremendous value in other people, welcomes them, rolls out the carpet and says, man, I am so glad you're here. Doesn't it make you feel good when you're the recipient of someone's hospitality? Doesn't it make you feel loved? Can I tell you that that's what people are not interested in knowing so much what we know as they are experiencing the goodness of God through us. You see, we live in a time where if God wants to touch a people, if He wants to reveal His goodness, if He wants to shed His love into someone else's heart, He needs a vessel to flow through. How many vessels in the house today? Amen? If we don't make ourselves available, God's hands are tied. Can you say amen? It's true. God says, I want to give you a hug. Where's a, where's a part of my body? Where's Pastor Andrea? <laughs> you have to be around here for a while to kind of understand that one. But, but God wants to flow through his body. God wants to speak through his body. He wants to encourage through one another. You see, when we gather together at church, we don't just come here to worship. We don't just come here to, to be taught. We come here to be equipped so that we can go out and practice hospitality with the world. Okay? That's what we're called to do. We're called, you know, when we, we talk about the love of God, what I'm really talking about is hospitality in action. All right? And if God wants to reach a community, if we want to pray and believe God for revival, then how many of you feel like you want to volunteer to be a part of that process? Amen. We, want, we pray for revival, but how many of you are willing to pray for your neighbor? Pray for revival, but I won't pray for the sick. See a need in your community and say, God, please meet that need. And God says, I want to. Are you available? Sorry, football game starts in an hour, you know. Sorry. <laughs> but that's what God's looking for. He's looking for a heart of hospitality. I want to develop a culture of hospitality. I don't just want to do church. I don't want to just be a Christian. I want to exemplify the life of Christ. I want to, I want to be a walking, living, breathing picture of the love of God manifest on the earth. How about you? Amen. John chapter 1 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know that the Word that you read in your Bibles every day, God wants it to become flesh? Every time that you find yourself in a situation and a Bible verse comes to your heart, comes to mind, more than likely God's speaking to you. And the question needs to be, God, how can I apply that verse in my life right now? Oh, but God, I, you, I'm not... No, not me. Well, Moses sounded the same way at the mount, didn't he? All right, I don't want to get to meddling too much. So anyhow, listen, the church, I was talking about practicing hospitality in our homes. The church, I'm speaking to the family here at River of Love, this is our home, okay? For those of you that consider the river your home, we need to practice hospitality. Amen. We need to be that representation to every individual who walks through these doors. You know, and God's, I think we've done a good job, but I think God's challenging us to go to the next level. Amen. We have a heart to reach the community. I'm telling you, they're not going to walk through the doors just because we're praying. We, we need to love the community, practice hospitality. And listen, when we begin to love others the way that Christ loved us, man, you, you're just not going to be able to keep people from coming because people respond. The Bible says that, we, that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God. How many of you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Amen. The goodness of God has caused you to change the way you think. Amen. So we need to practice hospitality. So hospitality has to do with how we treat others, right? 
Okay. So if you invite a friend over to dinner, you greet them well, you feed them well, you minister to their needs, you give them your very best, is that practicing hospitality? I would have said the same thing until the Lord showed me something yesterday. <laughs> Y'all ready? You might want to take your shoes off. <laughs> By our American definition, that's true. I mean, if you, if you invite your friends over and you have a meal or you just have some good conversation or you roll out the red carpet in the way that you do best, in America, we would say, hey, listen, that's, we're having a great time of hospitality, right? But I, wanna, I, I looked at, this, at the word that's translated hospitality in the Greek, and I learned something really really interesting, okay? The Greek word for hospitality, we'll see how my Greek pronunciation is here today, is philoxenos. Want me to say it again? Not that it matters because none of you are going to write it down anyhow. But it's philoxenos, okay? Did I say it different? If I said it three times, I'd probably say it different again, so I'll just leave it at that. But it's the, it's, it's, it's a compound word that's made up of two different Greek words. The first is, is philo. It's where we get the word philio or brotherly love, okay? And it literally means friend or brother or beloved, okay? And the last part of the word is exenos. Probably said it different there too, didn't I? And, and what that means is it means foreigner. It means stranger, okay? So philoxenos, y'all want to try it? Or hospitality means to love a stranger as a dear friend, okay? Hospitality means to love a what? Love a who? Love a stranger what? As a dear friend. Friend. How many of you, does that change the definition of hospitality a little bit? Okay. So the focus of the Greek word is not the action, but it's the object of our hospitality. You see? Hospitality has to do with who we practice this love of a brother with. It's to, to love a stranger in the same way that we would love a dear friend. That, my friend, is the word that is literally translated hospitality in our New Testament, okay? So the stranger is the, is the object. So let me ask you a question. Are we practicing hospitality when we invite our friends over for dinner? No, what's that called? That's called fellowship, <laughs> okay? When you invite your friends, when you invite people that you are already acquainted with, you already have relationship with, literally, if we go by the Greek definition, you are practicing fellowship. <laughs> In order to practice hospitality, you need to introduce a stranger, a foreigner, all right? Someone that you do not know. How many of you think that's important when it comes to Christianity? Christianity is not an us for and no more religion, all right? It's not about getting my blessing, getting my miracle, fulfilling my destiny at the expense of everybody else. Christianity is, is a relationship with an almighty God who values everyone that he knows more than himself. You know, in Philippians, it says that we're supposed to have this same mind in us, which is Christ Jesus that we're supposed to value our brothers as more important than ourselves? Can I tell you that God values you more than he does himself? Hello? Some of you, we just need to stop and do a little selah on that. When the Lord first showed me, I mean, how could Almighty God give his life on, give his son and go to the cross and die for my sins, not just because he loved me a little bit, he loved me more than himself. I don't know. I just kind of go berserk just trying to get a little bit of a revelation of that. 
And so his love is what? Romans 5, verse 5 says, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we sing that song, they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know. I'll just say it. I'm not going to sing. They'll know we are Christians (laughs) by our love. What does love look like? It's not just love you know, for me and Matt or Jennifer. Or it's not just love for the people that I know. It's love for strangers. You, you see, Jesus, every place that he ministered, the Bible says that he was moved by compassion. All right? I think compassion is the, is the energizing force behind hospitality. Because, you see, hospitality isn't just something that we do because, oh, wow, hey, I know this. Hey, you're a stranger, Come on over. Let's have dinner today or something, okay? Thank God I'm being obedient, <laughs> you know. There, there, there needs to be a heart that connects with the action. Does that make any sense? You see, sometimes we can go through the motions, but our hearts are disconnected, you see. When we minister to individuals, listen, the thing that's supposed to move us is compassion. I don't have to pray for the sick. I get to pray for the sick, okay? I don't have to practice hospitality with strangers. I get to. Yay. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Y'all look really, really excited this morning. (laughs) All right. I'll let you think about that. So let's look in Luke chapter 14. I'm going to wind down here. Y'all getting anything out of this this morning? Okay, cool. Luke chapter 14. See if this makes any sense now. Jesus said this. Let's listen to this in the context of the definition that we're talking about for hospitality. Loving a stranger or a foreigner as a dear friend. Jesus says, Luke 14, verse 12, and he went on to say to one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, And you will be blessed since they don't have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You see, we don't, when we practice hospitality, it's not just a matter of finding people who have needs. How many of you know every one of us have needs? All right. You might not be blind or uh, lame or crippled, but there are areas in your life where you don't see things the way that you should. Right? Right? There, there, there are things in our life that we stumble over, all right? We all qualify. So these are the individuals. Don't wait until, basically I think Jesus is saying this, don't just look for the perfect guest, because they probably don't exist. Love the people that you're around, okay? Oh, he's blind, oh, lame, oh, you know, Got this fault, that. I mean, we all, how many of you have the gift of criticism? (laughs) That gift will keep you from practicing hospitality, all right? We, We all have areas, and we can disqualify individuals. We can disqualify them from meeting our standard or our ability, maybe we don't feel like, man, we've got what it takes to practice hospitality. Can I tell you, it doesn't take a lot to love somebody. I think most people are okay if you're not perfect. You know, if we make an effort, if we do something beyond what our normal comfort zone is to demonstrate a sincere welcome. How's that for a good place to start? How many of you, 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 you're out at work or whatever, and, and, you, and you see somebody, and you got your basic, hey, how you doing? Great, great, great. 
And they say, well, hey, things aren't so, all fine, you know. And, and, and you know that when you say how you doing, that you really don't care how they're doing any more than when they say how you doing, if they care about what, how you're doing. You just say it and you go fine and everybody moves on and life's good. Any of you do that? I mean, I've even tried it on occasion. Somebody says, how are you doing? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to answer the question. And they don't want to know. They don't want to know the answer. <laughs> if I really wanted to know, I would have asked. Well, you did. <laughs> they just don't want to hear the answer, you know. But if you're practicing hospitality, how many of you know it's important to listen to the answer? How many of you think it would make a difference if you really listen to the answer. If somebody, if you ask somebody, how you doing, how many of you know you're going to find somebody that is poor, crippled, lame, or blind in one area of their life or another? You're going to meet them, I promise you, every time. So if we'll practice and develop a culture of hospitality, our antennas are up and saying, God, how do you want to love this person? God, how can I greet this person in a way that is just really gracious? You see? And if you understand grace, and this is a whole other teaching, but, but grace is just really the overwhelming pleasure of God to lavish you with his incomprehensible goodness and mercy and love. That's, that's God's countenance towards you 100% of the time. You know why? Because he chooses you. <laughs> he chooses you. And we have the opportunity as we develop a culture of hospitality to every person we meet to say, I choose you. Even though you may be blind, lame, crippled, whatever. I choose you and I'm going to greet you graciously. I'm going to be sensitive to your needs. I'm going to Kill the fatted calf on your behalf. And I'm going to give you my very, very best all of the time. How many of you think that would make a difference? Yay. Let's look at uh, one other scripture. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Who said that? Who? Oh, Jesus, actually. We just quote him. But Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. See, there should be something different about those of us who call upon the name of Christ and how we do relationships with one another that should exemplify the life of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. We don't just love those who love us. Anybody can do that. When's the last time you loved somebody that was unlovely? I mean, really unlovely. That's where testimonies are born. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? If you invite somebody over and you know they're going to invite you back. I mean, it's great fellowship. Hello? It's great fellowship, but it's not hospitality. I want to look at, at, at two verses that we looked at at the very beginning of the message, okay? Romans chapter 12. I want, I want you to read it again. I want to read it again. I want to see if you hear it a little bit differently this time. Let love be without hypocrisy. Romans chapter 12. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. How many of you hear that a little bit different now? You say, he, he, he's not just saying, hey, have fellowship, invite your friends over. Part of the gospel message is having a mindset and a purpose and a mission in life to constantly entertain strangers with brotherly love, okay? Hebrews chapter 13, let love of the brethren continue. Listen, 
first time I read this, I was wondering, well, what does that mean about people in the church? God says, do you know everybody in the church? Well, no. I don't know everybody in this room. So you know what? Even though there are brothers and sisters all around the auditorium here this morning, do you know that we're still supposed to practice hospitality with one another? It's important that we show hospitality, that we treat one another with God's kind of love. But not only that, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. That's the main area. That's the main focus of what Paul is saying when he talks about hospitality. Don't neglect to show hospitality. Why do you think Paul said that? Probably because it's easy to neglect hospitality, right? So he says, don't neglect hospitality. Listen, this is important. This is really important. Listen, you don't have to know the four spiritual laws. You don't have to have the Romans road memorized. But practice hospitality. Live your life in such a way that you treat every person that you meet like a dear friend. All right? How many of you think that would make a difference? How many of you think that would go a long way in creating a culture of hospitality and the world is looking for that? Amen? So, kind of with that in mind, what do you think that God means when he says, I want to create a culture of hospitality here at River of Love Community Church? What do you think? Anybody thinking this morning? Okay. I want you, I, I'm not asking you to answer out loud, but I want you to begin to ask yourself, what are the, Lord, what are you saying to me? How can I embrace this? How many of you know you're being invited on a spiritual journey this morning? Some of you have been crying out, I want more of God. I want to see more of your glory. I want to see more. I want to have more of your presence in my life. You know what the Lord's saying this morning? This is the way. This is the way. Practice hospitality. Can I give you that as an admonition this morning? Can I give you a charge and say, I charge you in the name of Jesus to practice hospitality? Well, you might say, well, pastor, I don't feel like it. I didn't ask how you felt. <laughs> the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And I'll tell you what, if I let my feelings get in the way, I'm not going to do nothing most of the time because I'm really, really good at coming up with excuses. Okay? So there are times where we have to recognize that God has a way of doing life. We didn't just get saved so that we could go to heaven. We got saved so that heaven could come back into us. Amen? So that his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth, in this earth, as it is in heaven. We want to see revival. We want to see the hand of God move. Listen, we've got to begin to position ourselves as the body of Christ. We've got to begin to tell this flesh it needs to get in line with the Word of God. Amen? And listen, if you don't feel like it, I can promise you if you will crucify your flesh, all right, and take a step of obedience, you're going to walk in the blessing of God. I could tell you so many stories. I could tell you so many stories of opportunities that I had to practice hospitality with strangers, and it was the last thing in the world my flesh wanted to do. But I knew God's love for others. And I knew, I just, I would pray, listen, if you don't feel the compassion of God, pray for it. God, I, give me your compassion. I'd be, you'd be surprised at what God does, how he answers that prayer. And individuals that maybe in the natural repulse you even that when God's love is shed abroad in your heart for them, that you're moved by compassion. We need to pray and ask God to let us see people through His eyes. How many of you think that makes a difference? Amen. If I look through my eyes, I've got a viewpoint, and it's not always a good one. 
But God's viewpoint is always good. And guess what? If we're not believing the best of others, we're not loving. You know, if we're envious or boastful or if we're taking into account wrongs that have been suffered, granted, I get it, life happens, but that's not the love of God, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8, need to memorize it. That's the hospitality of God in action, amen? All righty. Well, let me get you to stand this morning. You all still doing okay? How many of you feel like doing some hospitality? Amen? Amen. One person. Great. (laughs) Thank you, Kathy. (laughs) Just kidding. I want to pray this morning. And, uh, you know, there were... I just really want to kind of pray this message over you in one level. I want to, with every head bowed and every eye closed and... Just you and God, you know what I'm saying? God, I want you to examine. God, I want to take a moment to examine my own heart. I want to examine my own life. God, I just want to come before you this morning. I just want to be real. I just want to be transparent. I just want to say, God, I haven't always practiced hospitality. God, there's so many times where I'm on a mission to get something done and I see somebody that's hurting and I I even have a little sense in my heart that you want me to say something to somebody, but I I come up with an excuse. I'm not obedient. God, I just repent. God, lives could be changed if only I would be obedient. Your kingdom would be manifest if only I trusted you. If only I was committed and surrendered to a life of treating strangers like their friends. God, give me a heart to see people the way that you see them. And Lord, I just want to say to you right now, Lord, that I want to change the way I think about this. Let too many people pass me by. But Lord, I'm not going to do that anymore. Today's the day I'm going to draw my line in the sand. I'm going to say, Father, I want you to love others through me. I want to make myself available. Lord, you want to bring revival to the community, and Lord, it's not going to happen if I don't cooperate. So, Father, give me the faith and show me the specific individuals that you want me to reach out to. I know I can't reach everybody. That's too overwhelming. But Lord, there's one, there's two over a course of a week that I know that I can reach out and show your love to. I can reach out in some way and I can can greet them in a way that represents your passion for them. God, help me to be sensitive to the needs of the people that I meet. Lord, give me a heart that's eager to serve. And God, you gave your very, very best as you gave your son. Father, I want to give my very best. I don't want to hold back. I don't want to run this race and at the end of the day see a film clip of all of the opportunities that I missed. God, I want to run the race. I want to set my face like flint. God, I want to burn for you. I want to love like you love. God, that's the only way we're going to reach our community. Lord, develop in me a culture of hospitality. I know I need to be purposeful at first, but God, I pray that the day comes that it's just my default setting. But Lord, today I decide Just like I decided for you, I chose you for me. God, today I want to choose my community. Lord, today I want to choose my neighbor. Lord, today I want to choose that stranger. I don't want to wait to be chosen. I know I've been chosen by you. I want to choose others. I want to develop a heart of hospitality. Holy Spirit, come. 
fall upon us and in our lives. Cause us to be aware and sensitive to your leading like never before. God, we want to see our community touched for you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you're doing in hearts all around this room right now. God, this is the this is the time that really counts. It's what you do in our hearts after the message is done. And Lord, it's our amen is not really the word we say, but Lord, it's how we live our life as we go from this place. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, that we're going to be different in some small way. Lord, you're not grading us on how many people or how great a work we do. God, it's just that we care. Just that we notice what we haven't noticed before. God, let this place be a home. Let it be a refuge. Lord, let each person who's here be a safe place for the blind and the crippled and the lame and the hurting. Let us be your arms and hands extended. God, we promise to give you all the praise. We promise to give you all the glory. Lord, let your light shine through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a wrap. <laughs> so let's go, and let's, as we go, always share this scripture in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus said this, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Even as I have loved you, love one another by this, all men, friends, brothers, strangers, they'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So let's go and let's love God. Let's love one another and let's love our community in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Amen.